What's up, everybody, and welcome into the H&M Trucking Podcast. Glad to have you here today for episode eight of the show. Uh, we are talking about how to handle roadside breakdowns today, and we've got a lot of good information coming up. We're going to talk to uh, Scott Altstadt, who is a breakdown specialist. We'll hear from Deanna. Uh, James is coming up here right around the corner, but first... I wanted to make sure that we touch on something. Next week, we are going to do an episode surrounding the CVSA International Road Check. CVSA is, of course, the Commercial Vehicle Safety Alliance. They have announced that May 16th through 18th is this year's International Road Check, uh, which is a high-visibility, high-volume, 72-hour inspection and enforcement event where CVSA certified inspectors in Canada, Mexico, and the United States will conduct inspections of commercial motor vehicles and drivers at way and inspection stations. Uh, These are designated inspection areas along the roadway. Now, we're going to get deep into the weeds next week about everything that this entails uh, we're, we're efforting right now getting an official on from uh, CVSA or Department of Transportation to talk a little bit about this, but it's important to remember that this will have a focus. They're going to be focusing these inspections on anti-lock braking systems and load securement. Uh, like I said, next week we're going to get into all of this, so make sure to stay tuned and... Uh, Shout out to Deanna at Driver Advocacy. Let her know if there's anything that you want to hear about specifically or if you're interested in being on the show. That pretty much does it for our tease for next week. So let's get into handling roadside breakdowns. Uh, we've, Like I said, we've got a lot coming up here. Uh, we're going to talk to a driver who is, he was driving fall apart's fall apart car, man. I'm telling you, this thing was breaking down and was lit up like a Christmas tree in the dash. Uh, that's all coming up. Don't forget to follow us over at the H&M Trucking Facebook page and uh, look for all the links. Follow the podcast, share it with your friends and fellow drivers. Key down on some mud ducks and let them know what we're doing here. We're just trying to have a little fun and be informative, help out with safety and driver advocacy, all those good things. Uh, we're, we're closing the loop here, all right? Now let's get to the music and start this episode. From Omaha, Nebraska, to whatever lane you're driving, this is the H&M Trucking Podcast with your host, Marcus Bridges. Right off the top, joining us today, president of H&M Trucking, it's James Fonda. James, thank you so much for giving us some more of your time this week. You're starting to become a weekly guest on this podcast. How do you feel about that? You know, I'm coming to terms with it, mental terms. <laughs> well, you know, based on what Eve told me, I know that there's a bit of an adjustment period, and I think that's more me than it is the podcast, but whatever. I mean, you should take the blame. It's all you. <laughs> I got Only broad fair. shoulders, man. I got broad shoulders. We, I can, I can <laughs> handle this. So uh, we're talking about roadside breakdowns on today's episode. And uh, we're going to get in touch with Scott a little bit later. Deanna's got some things she wants to talk about. We're going to chat with a driver who's had a lot of problems and is now in a new truck and and loving it from what I understand. Uh, But from the standpoint of the company president, talk to me a little bit about how roadside breakdowns affect your day and and in lieu of that, also the rest of the staff. Well, I mean, breakdowns is, uh, you're seeing that across the board for on the, on the road repair costs have just skyrocketed, uh, since 2020, 2021, 22, and 23 now. You know, it used to be maybe only 13,000 a week on road repairs. And now we're like 40, 40 plus thousand a week in on road repairs. Wow. So yeah, it just beats the crap out of you. No fault other than, you know, it, it is what it is. Just trying to get new equipment is, uh, uh, you know, our model has been always based on selling equipment out 430,000 miles around that range. And with COVID and, and the fallout of after COVID, the lack of equipment has just put us, uh, put us behind. So, uh, and we're not the only, you know, we're not the only carrier in that, so everybody's in this boat. So, you know, we're doing our best to get, uh, we have like 108 trucks coming this year. I'll sell 85 and then I'll probably have to order. I'll try to get my hands on more next year and, and have to do a similar thing just to get caught up. I'm probably about 150 trucks that I've got to get off, the, off that I'd like to get off the fleet. 
Okay. And have have labor costs skyrocketed? I mean, obviously, parts, everybody knows if you've tried to fix a part on any vehicle, even a Huffy at this point, it, it takes months to get what you need. Uh, but I, I understand that, you know, sometimes some of these breakdowns can be handled without sending somebody out to the to the driver on the side of the road. But a lot of times you got to send somebody out there. Uh, what do labor costs look like compared to pre-COVID? Just depends where you're at. Um, and, uh, if, uh, if you have, you know, people that are fair and, and, and have good, uh, business ethics, uh, versus not, you know, like one time we had a, we had a driver that tipped his trailer, he got towed and the tow bill was $40,000. Oh, this was like literally like God. a month and a half ago, months ago. And I'm just like, really like, there's no way, but it, they, they literally hold your, your equipment hostage until you pay it. So. So, you know, if it's not just a breakdown per se, like the actual event, like, yes, that is frustrating for the driver, but you know, what is, what is that cost to actually break down? Right. So the, the on-road repairs are, are, are happening more because the truck's older, uh, older than we're, we're used to typically running them. Then it's, we're paying, we do break, you know, the old drivers know we pay breakdown pay. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so that's just money out that we're out. Then it's, well, what's that cost of lost revenue? Uh, I mean, it just, it just compounds. So it's just a frustrating situation that the trucking industry is in right now. Sure. Now, uh, what would you tell drivers about uh, just roadside breakdowns in general? What kind of preparation, what kind of uh, headspace do they need to be in? You know, uh, what are some standard operating procedures, things like that? Well, I mean, some of the stuff can be prevented. Uh, We had a guy that just, he had, he just got nailed by a state trooper like last week. And most of this could got caught by a simple uh, check, you know, you're like your you, your your more your morning pre check, your pre trip trip check, and he just didn't do any of it. Uh, he would easily caught these wires. So some of it, yeah, it's, it's the truck. Some of it's like, yeah, you can catch this some of the stuff on your own. Um, you know, if, if something happens, you know, you gotta be you gotta be flexible. You know, so you get you get different people, right? You have some people that are like, "Yep, I'm willing to help out," and and uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, their, their income a lot relies on that truck. So, trying to convince some of these guys to say, "Hey, like, yeah, yeah, you're a company driver, but that truck is also your income. So, you want to take good care of that that equipment because that equipment is what's paying your bills." But you know, you, you, so, and you have guys that are very useful and they'll, they'll carry tools and they'll help you on the road, and you have other guys that are just, "Nope, not my company, not my, you know, not my truck, not my problem." So it just it, it varies and, and it's really situation situation to situation. Like I had a driver one time; he was up in uh, North Dakota. It was like four years ago, and he did he, he had popped a tire. And I don't know. I want to say he was ten mi- ten minutes away, like up like a mile or two, like down the road. And if he had just put his flashers on and drove, no no one's gonna bug him. Instead, he decided to wait five or six hours for a tow truck to yes. get him down the street. And it's just like. And the, and the tire that was popped wasn't even like a, a relevant. It was on the trailer, and it was and it wasn't loaded. It just you can play both sides. <laughs> it's frustrating for on on all parties every time. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's one of those things where if you can if you can feel safe with something like that, and you feel like you can get those last five to ten minutes. I, look, I, I'm not a driver, so I can't put myself in his shoes. But I, I would say that. Um, that that would be way too frustrating for me as a person. Like, I don't know if I could live with myself on the side of the road for those five hours waiting. I think I would walk those last uh, ten minutes right. and just get to somebody so that I could say, "Hey, this is what happened." Right? Um, yeah. Like if you're like if you have like a serious safety issue, like absolutely. Like, uh, but sometimes it's not the case. So it, you know, you, you take uh, every situation as it comes, and and you deal you deal with it as it comes. Right. So. Uh, obviously, we're always here for the driver to to help them in whatever ways they need, and everybody, everybody's needs are different. And I might recommend it, give Deanna a call if you do have that like six hour layover when you're waiting for somebody. That's you know, driver advocacy is great. You can chat with Deanna; she'll keep you from wanting to pull your hair out on the side of the road, and uh, you know, maybe you can uh, iron out some of the things that are going through your head too in that point in time because. Look, I'm a golfer, so I'm I'm very well versed in frustration and knowing that I can I have the ability to do something, but I'm prevented 
from doing it because of, you know, a lake or a pond or a sand trap, whatever the case may be. Um, but I, I wish at those times that I had like a golfer advocacy program where I could just call somebody and, and talk uh-huh. this out because it's getting bad and I'm going to waste a lot of money throwing my clubs in the pond. I know that's not really a good comparison, uh, but it's 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 a thing that I have and it's a thing that I, I, I hold my frustration very near and dear. Um, I, I don't know. Are you a golfer, James? Uh, Dale would be the golfer. Dale I'm, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go play golf once in a while, but, um, it's not really a, you know, I got enough going on. It's, it's hard to say. I want to go take off four hours to go play golf. Right. You sound like one of those and guys. My, and, that... and you got a golf course. My brain's not even there anyway. So I'm like, what did I just pay for this round for? <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. One of those guys that, uh, you know, maybe you're going out to drink and maybe you'll play some golf while you're doing that. Yeah, okay. something like that. I got it. Well, it's always better with a few on board. There's no question about that. So, uh, James, I, I appreciate it. Our conversations are always fun, and uh, I think it's a it's a very special peek behind the curtain that you give the drivers uh, into what the front office deals with, what you deal with, and uh, you know the support that H and M gives the drivers is, is really second to none. So, from from the guy that kind of gets to be a fly on the wall and see it all take advantage of the support that you get these roadside breakdowns not fun for anyone like you said um i just appreciate you coming on chatting with the drivers and my, myself a little bit and uh, i'm sure because we've got a big cvsa international road check episode coming up next week we'll be in touch with you again all right i'm good marcus all right take it easy james thank you yep bye We figured it would be a good idea to get somebody in that is an expert when it comes to breakdowns. And so we went with Scott Aldstadt, who is the breakdown specialist at H&M, one of the breakdown specialists at H&M. Scott, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Of course. Uh, We we really appreciate the time. Now, uh, we are talking about handling roadside breakdowns today and... um, just talk to me a little bit about what the protocol is. What's standard operating procedure? My truck breaks down. Now what? First thing, as soon as your truck breaks down, um, probably need to get a hold of your dispatcher, let them know what's going on so they know what's going on with the load and where you're at. And then give us a call and um, give us a rundown of what's going on with the truck or trailer, whatever the issue is, and um, see if we can either get it diagnosed, if something we can fix, have the driver take a look at or if we need to get you to a dealer or, or get somebody to you. And what type of, uh, of layover are we talking for a lot of the truckers? Let's say that you do need to get somebody out to them. Uh, do you have people regionally or is, is somebody coming locally from, from there in Omaha? How would you handle that? Wherever you're at, um, we'd call whoever the closest vendor is for whatever the breakdown issue is. And it's usually going to be a couple hours. Um, our ETAs, a lot lately for sending somebody out to you is about 90 minutes. Oh, that's not bad. I, that's not bad at all. I mean, we hear horror stories of, you know, oh, I waited out here for six, eight hours. Those are probably the exception, not the rule, I would assume. It gets to be like that sometimes during the winter or when there's bad weather and and uh, services in the area are really busy. So we, we try and tell our drivers a lot during the winter to make sure that they're prepared and bring blankets or something if they need to during the winter because that could happen. Sure. Now, uh, blankets in the winter, obviously that one's a, a big one, but what other type of preparation do you urge your drivers to uh, conduct uh, for these scenarios? Make sure you do your pre-trip. Do the walk around on the truck and trailer. Make sure everything is good to go. Um, try and carry extra fuses if you can. Screwdriver and a wrench sometimes can get you going. During the winter, we like drivers to carry extra anti-gel and um, maybe some anti-freeze coolant to take with them to run through the airlines in case the airlines freeze. I think that's about it. What about uh, like a flashlight or a headlamp? Um, I've heard that that can kind of help with the safety, you know, especially if it's at night. Uh, sometimes drivers might yeah. uh, alert somebody with a yep. flashlight. Definitely carry a flashlight with you. That should be something that you should carry with you, yeah. So what kind of breakdowns do you see that are more common than others? I, I know that with, you know, engines, you're going to see every single different type. And, of course, all the other things, electronics on the trucks and computers and whatnot. But what's something that you see pretty common uh, out there that, uh, 
you know, truckers should just kind of be aware that it's probably going to happen or, or has a high probability to be the reason they're broken down? The top things are going to be tire repairs and that we need to send somebody out to you. And then there's going to be issues with wiring or just the truck shutting down because there might be a, a loose wire, which a lot of times is a loose battery cable. Um, a lot of times that's just a 916th wrench. Or uh, with these new trucks with a lot of the computer systems on them, um, they might just need to be reset. And that's just turning off the battery switch for about 45 minutes, letting the truck reset, and then turning it back on. And then uh, another ma- major thing is because the truck and trailer is all airlines and air is having an air leak somewhere on the truck or trailer. And then we would need to send somebody out there that can have the fittings or whatever's leaking air wherever that is and get that fixed. Is there ever a huge sigh of relief that comes over you and the driver as well when it's just a computer reset? I mean, that's that's a 45 minute uh, layover real quick and easy. Nobody has to be dispatched. That's got to be one where you're like, you kind of feel lucky when that happens. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Because there's, it's becoming more common for it to be a computer issue these days with a lot of the trucks in the computer. Um, it is nice when you can just reset it and then get up and going again and don't have an issue anymore. And these computers used to be so easy, man. It was control alt delete and then uh, you come back five minutes later after you get a snack and everything was fine. But then they wrapped a whole truck around it and kind of complicated things. Yeah. Right. Right. Yep. <laughs> and that's, uh, it pretty much controls how the truck, how it's running and all the parameters and everything on the truck. And so um, when it shuts down, it, it kind of takes everything out with it. Got it. So uh, any advice, anything that you would like to say to the drivers out there? There's a lot of them listening. Um, Obviously, breakdowns are going to happen. But I have you here right now, so I might as well give you the floor if there's anything that you would like to say to the drivers uh, to kind of just give a blanket message about this type of thing. A lot of times it could be an issue that you don't realize that it is. If um, Sometimes you might think it's a a mechanical issue and you don't realize that it's It is the computer that is controlling the mechanics of the truck. So um, a lot of times just shutting off that uh, battery switch and letting it sit for half an hour, 45 minutes, and let everything reset could could be what uh, gets you going. And also carrying fuses, checking your fuses right away when you have something that's not working like wiper motors or window switches or whatever. And because a lot of times it could just be a 5, 10 cent fuse rather than sending somebody out to you that could take 90 minutes at least and, and then uh, at least a two or $300 fee just to get them going on the road. We've seen that a lot where it could be just a fuse and we're, we're out th- at least $300. Oh, wow. Yeah, fuse is yeah. Uh, one of the cheapest fixes that you can get out there. I mean, if you had a nickel in your pocket and you could just fix it with a nickel, it would be a lot the same. So uh, great advice right. there, Scott. Really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, breakdown Supervisor Scott Aldstedt, we really appreciate having you on here, and uh, we will get you back on again because there's going to be more to talk about in the future when it comes to breakdowns. I'm absolutely sure of it. All right, great. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good day, Scott. You too. I'm really excited about this. We've got another driver profile to do for you today. Joining us here on the H&M Trucking Podcast is David Rodriguez. He goes by DR. DR, thanks for joining us today. How are you doing out there? I'm doing all right. Having everything talked to me in this truck. Yeah, you got a new truck, I understand, uh, and we'll get into that here in just a moment because uh, we're talking about roadside breakdowns today. And and real quick, <laughs> before I get to that, uh, let me know what's your CB handle, what's your truck number, first of all. I uh, won't run a CB handle. I used to back in the early 90s, but now it's just a holler that the truck name. This is H&M coming, or you know, eastbound, westbound, just whatever comes, comes to mind. Okay, and what's your truck number? Oh, mine is uh, 2358. Awesome. And where are you joining us from today? Where's Where's the route got you? East of, I'm uh, looking at a sign, Pocahontas, Arkansas. Okay. So you're out there, you're out there dinking around kind of in the south, kind of Midwest, that, that little like uh, middle area there. Uh, how's the weather out there? Everything, everything good on the road today? Oh, everything's good except all your little back roads. You go two miles one way and three miles the other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Two steps forward, one step back, right? Yeah, it's just craziness. Everybody decided they want to work off the shoulder today when there ain't no shoulder. <laughs> it's just kind of weird. I didn't know Arkansas had right shields. I'm used to them in Texas, but not up here. And, and what do you mean by that? To, uh, explain that to me. Uh, rice paddies, you know, like they grow rice. I mean, I'm really... Ah. I thought they did it because of the Gulf Coast, but I didn't know they did it this way up here. Okay. All right. I got you. Now, today's uh, today's episode, of course, you're, you're on here for a very specific reason, DR. Uh, All to- right. <laughs> today's episode is about, as I said, roadside breakdowns. And when I talked to Eve last week, I said, Eve, I need somebody that may have had some issues recently. <laughs> and, and I mean, the email came back immediately. She says, I got somebody in mind. He's had all sorts of problems. And I oh, think... Yeah. Even that undersells it, Dr. So, talk to me about what you've been going through in the last month to year with the truck that you were driving last week when we spoke. Ooh, the last month, I started a month before. Started back in March. I want to say 2065. It was one of the black mobiles I was out. And before that, I had a lot of other prior problems within the year. They all added up. But just in the last month, I spent what? Two days down in Indiana trying to figure out the problem. They couldn't figure it out, so it was electronic. I got halfway up the road from there. It's right there on the Tennessee side. Got going into just before Chattanooga. I was uh, still north of Chattanooga, I believe. Damn truck just decided to shut down. I just came out of the shop no more than three hours. So it shut down, put me on the side of the road. I had to call for a tow truck. They came got me into Chattanooga. Got a call about an uncle of mine had a heart attack, so I decided to leave from there. They kept the truck, but it's supposed to have been done within a week. Uh, two weeks later, uh, they get me back up to the truck, and it's like, what the hell? I leave. Supposedly, they changed out like six or eight sensors this go around. Everything from lean assist to stop the stability crap to the engine. Uh, there was a sensor on the engine, a sensor on the transmission, the old pressure, pressure sensor, stuff like that. So I get out of there. I get down the road, maybe hell, Chattanooga. I might have made it to, might have made it to Paducah, Kentucky. When I'm calling in, and my whole dash is lighting up. Now I'm having anti-lock brake issues. Uh, all this and that. They said, "All right, we'll try to get you in." So I'm working my way back to the yard. And that's about a day goes by, and all of a sudden I call back again. Say, "Man, I might not make it." Now I'm getting other sensor things popping up. They checked it. Now my DAF sensor and some other sensors were popping up. Well, they brought the truck directly into Omaha. <laughs> I can imagine. And and that's just like, I mean, once it gets that bad, are you pretty much thinking, I got to get a new truck? I can't keep losing time to this thing. Well, you know, before that, when I got it, you know, I got it for lightly used, had a thousand, a hundred thousand on it. This all started about the 400,000 mark. I've been with them about two years, going on two years, I believe. Two years, yeah. And when I started, it just, all, all this started up just recently. But before that, when I first got it, it was my first week there. I knew problems were going to be happening. I took off from there the first week out of orientation. I take off, and I get going to, back home to West Texas. I was in Texas at that time. I start going that way, and I get about as far as Oklahoma City. Get caught in a rainstorm. I have to call in. I'm sitting on the side of the road. Lightning struck supposedly a little too close to me. Ride the computer and a bunch of other crap on it. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, so I had pulled over at the beginning of the trip. So I had pulled over. They worked on that. They kept it there for three weeks at that shop in Oklahoma City. They had to get me a van to get me back down to the house. It was Thanksgiving actually, so I had to get back down to the house. Got there day of Thanksgiving. So uh, you know, I started then, and I came back. They called me back one week and you're ready to go. I came back. I get called back. I'm about to, you know, leave in the rentals. No, no, no. Go back. Go back. Why? Uh, they just tried it again and more issues. So I went back. <laughs> they did that about twice. Yeah. Oh, that man. Truck was, saw that an electronic on it. Shortly after that, I thought I was on a good roll six months. I started noticing radiators, you know, leaking or something. They couldn't figure it out. So Minnesota, one of the TAs, replaced uh, – Replace the reservoir, replace some lines. Two weeks later, same problem. They replaced the reservoir. And I found out those things are about 700. So <laughs> they replaced that. And I went about it. A week later, it's back in another shop because it's still doing leaking. They figured out uh, they couldn't find it. Got to the shop and they got some, I think it's the radiator. 
So I, I went to one of their shops. I bought another Volvo. Uh, nothing they could do. They said they couldn't figure it out. They ran pressure tests, all this and that, and nothing was coming up. So I left. No more than a week, I get back down to Omaha. Uh, Trent and them check it. said, nah, man, you got a split radiator. So they shoot me down to Volvo. They replace that radiator. I get going out of there. As soon as I leave, about three days later is when that damn uh, turbo, one of the lines, one of the turbo went off. They had to replace it. And then here shortly about on this last replacement, I've had a new turbo replaced, the injectors, all sorts of crap, man, within the, within the year. Man, held together with duct tape and bungee cords, it sounds like, <laughs> DR. I mean, do you ever feel like that truck just never had a chance? I am only a hundred grand on it. You did good for 300,000 miles, but after that, nothing but trouble. Yeah, I, I think just, you know, every now and then, this is, it was it was good when it did run. I mean, I got nothing against it. It was a good truck, made me money, but uh, it was just, you know, I've been through Chevy Fords, and now I'm in a Ram. It's that I'm going to get hit for that one. Anyway, I've been through them all, and I'm just like, the Chevy, the damn engine blew on me. The Ford transmission went out on me. And, you know, now the Hemi's been good to me for the last 10 years or 15, so I've been staying with them. And it's just like, you know, you, they're all good, but then you get one lemon, and it's like, damn. Right, you can't get away from it. It makes you feel like you never want to buy one from that manufacturer again. And I, I look, I had an old Mercury Cougar when I was in high school. It was old champagne colored thing. Yeah, yeah. with with uh, they had the the wine red um, uh, felt like uh, almost felt uh, seats in it. I mean, it was it was disgusting. But I swear to you. You'd drop it into drive, and when you skipped by neutral, the bright lights would come on, and then you have to put it back in neutral to shut the brights off, and then you could go back to drive. It it was an absolute – and the kid that I sold it to, it caught on fire and burnt to the ground sitting on the side of a highway uh, out in northeastern Oregon. And I, I looked at it and said, I'll never have another Mercury Cougar again, but – you know, I drive a bunch of Fords. I've been in Fords my entire life. And sooner or later, you find one. I had a little Ford Focus, quarter million miles on that thing, never had a problem. So I don't know, man. It's it's like you said, you're kind of a luck of the draw situation. You might end up with something that's going to get you 10, 15 good years, or you might end up with something that's going to be in the shop eight times in six months. Yeah, it's, that's, that's crazy. Like I told him on this new truck, man, I know the shop was like, what? As soon as I got it, I went down the road and said, you know, the windshield leaks and the doors leak. <laughs> <laughs> and and I know that. I, I know that. <laughs> that was the problem I had with my other truck. Yeah, they replaced the windshield four different times. Wow, it's like Walter White and Breaking Bad, just driving around with tape on the windshield for the first three seasons. Couldn't get that thing fixed, man. <laughs> that's that's hilarious. So now, it's like as soon as I seen that, I'm thinking to myself, "Oh shit, not again! No, no, no!" <laughs> so, talk me through a little bit about what your mindset is, because with our episode today on how to handle roadside breakdowns, you obviously well, are very, uh, very experienced in this. What's the first thing that goes through your mind? How do you stay safe when you're broken down on the side of well, a freeway? As soon as you see the, this gives you kind of like a warning. You'll see lights and everything and all. First thing I do is try to shoot for an off ramp or a rest area or a truck stop. I try to get complete, as completely off the road, just basically to stay away, just get off the damn road. Cause it's not so much as just little four wheelers. It's mostly like fellow truck drivers that are just, I don't know, man. They just, they just don't pay attention when they see a truck on the side. You slow down, flash the lights at them to move over and they still fly by that truck sitting on the road. So it's kind of just try to stay away from it, you know, and just I try to go in somewhere safe where I'm not going to get towed or something, you know, but it's, that's kind of hard to find anymore, too. Yeah. No, absolutely. But, quick, but I quickly try to call the end of the yard, you know, and try to get them. And if it's after hours, I'll just pull over somewhere safe and suck my thumb basically till like <laughs> 730 when I get somebody at the shop because that, that we go through Volvo and, man, they make you jump through hoops. I mean, I've had to wait six hours on a flat tire, and it's like, good God, just to get somebody to me. Oh, six hours, and there's just nothing to do, right? The time never passes any slower than when you're oh, just stopped, yeah. right? I mean, it's sad when you take a – when you take your uh, – what is it? When I do my, my break sitting on the side of the road, I mean, it's just like, damn, I could do a <laughs> – be here long enough. <laughs> 
Uh, so, uh, you know, as, as far as getting off the road, obviously that's going to be preferable. Cause like you said, sometimes drivers just get on autopilot. They don't move over. Um, I've seen it a hundred times and, and I've already said in this podcast as a four wheeler, um, you got to treat trucks just like you would treat emergency vehicles, it, even though you're probably not going to get a ticket unless you do something really egregious and not move over in a lot of states, you should move over and, and, and get, as much room as you can, because as I was talking to uh, to Dean Edmonds earlier, you just never know when somebody's going to walk out on the side of that rig. You never know when somebody's working on it. You can't predict other people's behavior. So getting away from the road is is definitely paramount. But what what do you try to remember and try to go through like as a process if you are on the side of the road? Well, best of your side of the road, first thing that comes to mind, I try to get one tandem if I can on the dirt, get me further off the white, run out and set the triangles as quick as you can. And if you got lights, run your hazards. And of course, put on your safety vest or something. People can see you and have one in your hand swinging so they can see you walking. You know, if you got a flashlight, I see some of our fellow drivers that get out with a flashlight, flash it at them. This, that. Anything will help to get their attention. But even then, it's almost like the deer in the headlight look. You do all that, and they start shooting torches. Like, what the hell? <laughs> you do everything you can, and they start driving right at you because they're looking at you, right? Yeah, I'm just like, <laughs> what the hell is wrong with this guy? <laughs> Have you had any close calls out there while broken down? Man, due to, due to the, um, I'm here and safety and fellow drivers, I'm like to tell you no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll use that as, as a little bit of, uh, of anecdotal evidence that you just should always have the triangles and the safety orange and any lights that you can, hazard lights, obviously, uh, without getting too deep into your own personal experience out there. Uh, it's just, uh, let's just say it's like Frogger out there sometimes. <laughs> And I am, funny. I am old enough to get that reference, and you're right. It's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, damn it, people. So when we were talking, setting up this interview last week, uh, it was kind of funny, and I just have to share this because – you had something in your old truck that was beeping at you on the dash and you were talking to me and the driver in front of you and it was like a it was like speed 3 the movie because you were saying I can't go below 55 or this thing's <laughs> going to shut off on me uh did you make yeah, it was, where you were headed <laughs> Yeah a lot of times I don't know where the heck I was at I think I was headed back to Iowa but it was uh yeah because I noticed with the truck, with all them sensors going off the last go round, if I slowed down too much, it started puttering, jerking. It was like, oh, hell, so I had to keep it at a certain speed. <laughs> speed limit 70. Two trucks in front of me decided they wanted to do 40 side by side. No construction, nothing. As I come up on them, I try to get over it, and then the other truck shoots over, and that's when that beep, all that beeping went off, and this truck tries to want to break, and you get too damn close. And now what got me and startled me, I never really paid attention to it. I never noticed it. You turn the thing on and damn horn goes off. That startled the hell out of me. <laughs> yeah. To be honest, it startled me too, DR. <laughs> turn to get over and it started honking. I'm like, I don't know. Well, weird feeling. Yeah, no joke, man. Well, I'm glad you made it safe. And uh, I also just wish that some of these drivers would understand that uh, this thing, you know, sometimes we can't get it below 55. We don't know if it's going to blow up like in the movie or if it's just going to start throwing <laughs> rods and start smoking. But either way, uh, really glad that you made it. Tell me a little bit about the new truck. What are you, what are you driving now? I mean, I'm guessing it's another Volvo. It's, it's a Volvo. It's a 23. It's so far... So good, it's running, it's pulling the load, we're doing good, but that's about to get where I'm at right now. Give me a second, I'm going to pull in here and try to get 50 gallons of fuel in a non-spot. Couldn't get fuel at the last stop, but how bad my luck train going. I stopped over there to, what the hell was that, Rob Jonesboro. The pilot I was at wouldn't accept my damn card, then I got to, went up the road to the Loves. Their pumps are all being worked on. Trucks are backed up. It's like, man. Dude, you've got like this little black cloud of bad luck following you around right now, I feel like. Oh, well, it's been around me since the day I was born, man. I just learned to live with it. <laughs> so are you of, you kind of prone to uh, to bad luck in, in just your life uh, in general? Man, yeah. 
some of the guys that see me at work, I know they don't ask about my arm, but I got electrocuted in 79. Hit and run later on that year and hit that year, busted both knees, both upper and lower jaws. And then, you know, just crazy stuff like that. Had just besides about 40 some stitches across the skull for ignorance. It's just stupid stuff like that. 40 stitches for ignorance is what you said there. And uh, that's. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I jumped out of the truck and it has a rack up on top of a pickup. And I, well, my head hit the damn thing and it split my wig open. Oh, God, man. <laughs> 40 <laughs> stitches. That sounds like you really jumped out. Like, were well, you on that, a dead sprint? That, no. The first one was, uh, the first one was like 12. I got hit with a hole, which is, uh, when you chop cotton in West Texas, a cousin of mine hit me. That gave me like nine. Second one, a cousin threw a rock or a brick at me. That gave me another four. Then that one there, when I jumped up, gave me like 11 or 14. They accumulated, man. Yeah, I mean, you, do you have a little spot somewhere in the cab of your truck where you're keeping hash marks for stitches? Because I feel like you're going to lose count sooner or later. Nah, it's just cool. Like I said, it's just accidents, man. After I graduated this and that, I got two pins, a plate, and two screws in my ankle. I busted it down low, up high, and up in the middle. And my leg, that's kind of, you know, I'm just, I've gotten so used to it, like you said, accidents and all. You kind of see it, you get a little precautious, you pay a little more attention, and you just kind of, some of the guys might laugh when they see me get out of the truck. I'll always look up, because, like I said, I got electrocuted, so I'm always looking up for wires. This is crazy little things that, if you don't notice it, a little quirk, everybody's like, what the hell is he doing? <laughs> He's I might be walking up. I'll always stop in the parking lot, look behind me, beside me. I'll even look up. And everybody's like, what are you doing? Making sure nobody's coming. <laughs> <laughs> you get to that point after a while. I imagine. Now, I, I have to ask, how did you get electrocuted? We were, uh, let's see, we check uh, statute of limitations. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> we, were out, <laughs> we, were out, we were out of West Texas, a small town of Spur, where I'm from. We played six-man football. Back then, we still were 2 a but anyway, we're out there. We used to go hunting. I called them brown squirrels. I found out later by my new, my third wife that, you know, with a choice of words, you know, with the dumb in front of the almost asinine. And she said, uh, those are chipmunks, not brown squirrels. I said, oh, we called them brown squirrels. Hell, I didn't even know. So we picked the grant. We used to lay out the irrigation pipes, you know, like water, but they the ground ones. We'd lay them out. Whatever's in them would run in them. You put a burlap bag on one end. The other three guys raise the pipe. Whatever's in their pipe, it's aluminum, slides to the bottom, lands in the burlap bag. You pick it, slap it. You either got you a rabbit, an armadillo, and hopefully not a skunk. <laughs> you know, a spoon or, you know, or something else. That day, it decided the wind blew, and it ran from transformers. Something like 12,000 or 14,000 bolts went through it because it tore up all the transformers and everything. So it blew in the arm, blew out the shoulder, blew out all the fingertips, blew holes across the skull and everything. They took skin grass off both legs and everything. It's pretty squirrely on that one. Yeah, I can imagine. It, you know, I, I, I come from a farming community, and I set pipe a little <laughs> bit in high school. And oh, yeah. I always thought that the farmer that I set pipe for was a little bit overzealous about telling me, you got to be careful when you lift these pipes up to drain them. You got to be careful. Yeah. I never actually thought that that was like, uh, that there was a true story behind that, but he might have What's been that? telling me about you, DR. Yeah, it happened about back in 79. I mean, I keep up with the years, this and that. And like I said, I even pay attention to weird stuff. Like this year, back in March, I just turned 58. And that's 23, and I noticed the number on the truck is 2358. So I said, are the guys in the shop messing with me? <laughs> <laughs> you just, yeah. your brain gets a little more in tune to see those patterns because you're wondering what's coming next, right? <laughs> I'm just ready to look what's going to happen. You know, i got to pay attention to everything. Absolutely. Well, listen, Dr. It's been great having you here. I know you're busy out there. I want to let you get back to uh, to paying attention to what's going on and uh, not listening to me, Gab. But thank well, you. Cool. I'm, actually, I'm actually sitting still. Oh, perfect. Well, I, I still I really appreciate the time that you've taken. Uh, I want to give you the chance. Anything that you want to say to any of your fellow drivers, or to H and M as a company, or to me as a person, uh, well, the, the floor well, is yours. So far with this outfit, you know, I did uh, my first 12 was over the road, mainly East Coast, doing bed bug and house furniture. 
I came out of that, came back to Texas, and I did uh, 14 years local, unloading windows, door, and trim by hand, you know, by yourself into the new garages and all that for all that new construction. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what kind of wore the knees out. I decided to come here when old man Randy come and said, yeah, man, I'll give it a shot. I tried it, liked it. Nice outfit for most. I mean, you might catch a driver on an off day, but I'm going to say mainly all of them, man. They're all pretty cool. They, uh, everybody talks to you. Everybody's sociable. You know, everybody's, everybody's nice, man. But, there's, you know, everybody's got their own comments, this and that. But that's cool. But at least everybody gets along. I like that, you know, not... I haven't seen it when you come in, you know, like where I used to work, you holler and I'm ready to throw down with somebody because somebody's being stupid. Here it's like, all right, it's cool, you know, it's, everybody's willing to understand and everything. And that's different working for an outfit like that where you can actually, you feel, you feel all right, you feel like you want to be there and on. It's just, like I said, just one bad truck and I see other drivers break down not as much. Maybe some got bad luck with tires, you know, it's just everybody has an issue with something. But as far as people and work and the staff and all, nah, man, it's, to me, it's, it's a nice place to work. I mean, people treat you treat you nice. Everybody talks to you by name, and they try to do their best to get you in and out quick. Granted, every now and then you get stuck somewhere, you know. But like I said, I'm used to being shut down somewhere, you know, like even Connecticut when you do that. You know, so you, 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 get, you get used to that, but some drivers aren't too used to, man, I can't sit here for a day, right? you know, i got to make money. Well, we all got to make money, man, but it's just, I've learned that, you know, the master attitude you have, the master people get to you, the worse things go. Just take it in stride, be mellow, be calm, you know, and just, you know, it'll work itself out. Well, if anybody's an authority on that, I would say that it's you, DR, for sure, uh, with everything that you've been through. And, uh, you know, I don't want to pat myself on the back here too much, but I'm going to take this opportunity to say, what other trucking outfit has a podcast, right? Right. So I know my <laughs> tails in the driver. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time, DR. Be safe out there. Keep the shiny side up. And uh, we will definitely come back and have you back on the podcast again uh, sometime later on. All right? I appreciate it, man. Y'all take care. My fellow drivers out there, be careful, man. I'll holler at you guys later. Everybody be safe. Thanks, DR. Have a good day. Yes, sir. Checking in with us to chat a little bit about the safety side of how to handle roadside breakdowns. We've got Dean Edmonds, safety specialist there at, uh, ex- excuse me, safety director at H&M. Uh, Dean, slap my hand if I get that uh, that that position wrong, man. Every single time, you're the you're the guy now. <laughs> well, unofficially, officially, I am the safety manager until I get my certification completed. So I'm in limbo, but I'm taking on the challenge awesome well thank you so much for joining us here today uh as i said we are talking about how to handle roadside breakdowns on this episode and um obviously wanted to have you on to talk about kind of how you guys look at roadside breakdowns from the safety side of things uh what tips and tricks can you offer the drivers um what advice do you have for them obviously this is something that uh, you kind of feel like everybody's going to deal with sooner or later. It's not like an accident where you kind of have to be unlucky or make a mistake. Sometimes vehicles just break down. So uh, talk to me about that from the safety standpoint and what you would like drivers to do to make sure and stay safe while taking care of this. Well, sure. Um, I'm, in, I'm in kind of a unique situation with, with this particular question. Uh, Previous to my safety experience, I spent eight years as a breakdown manager for another trucking company out of here in Omaha, Nebraska. So I've been very focused on roadside, uh, roadside calls, uh, roadside breakdowns, those types of things. And safety, regardless of whether I was the safety manager or the breakdown manager, safety was always a major concern. You know, no two situations are alike, but it's important to follow, you know, just some basic guidelines and to report as much as you can in details. That way, when we call a road service out or a road service arrives, they can be prepared with the proper tools, uh, with the, you know, with any other equipment that they might need. You know, obviously with with tires and stuff like that when they're on the driver's side or the left side of the truck when a 
when a roadside service comes out, that's going to put them directly into the line of fire, in my opinion. So, you know, if possible, uh, always try to find your place where you can pull off into a wide shoulder onto an exit or, you know, exit ramp, someplace where uh, the person that's going to come out to uh, do repairs on your vehicle have a place, a safe place to work without being in danger of being hit by a vehicle. Now, there are long stretches of highway out there that don't have much for for a wide shoulder and um, of course, a fully loaded uh, truck, you're not going to be pushing that thing anywhere. So, what? Uh, let's say that you can't find a, a wide shoulder and you're, you're in a real narrow spot, but you're broken down. Uh, what's the protocol then, Dean? Well, obviously, uh, anytime that you're broke down, first thing we want you to do is to turn on your hazards. Uh, make sure that uh, you put out the triangles or any type of uh, lining equipment that you might have to, uh, to warn any oncoming traffic that you are parked on the shoulder, you're not moving, uh, so they can be aware as they approach. And being a driver on the road, you should always be looking for that and hopefully uh, uh, observe the move over laws that you know most states have. To, so, you know, try to just put yourself in a position if you're coming upon a breakdown to move over and uh, give those people as much room to work as possible. Yeah, and it's a good point, something that we should probably emphasize a little bit. A lot of states do have laws uh, that require that you move over. Some don't, but in my travels, I've seen that most people, I, I shouldn't say most, a good percentage of people don't get over when there is a truck on the shoulder, and that's always amazed me. You should look at this just like an emergency vehicle, just like an ambulance or a cop. If you're going to pull over to give a cop room when they've got somebody pulled over on the side of the road, why wouldn't you pull over into the left lane to give the giant truck that might be broken down on the side of the road the same courtesy? Um, It's something I've actually been doing for longer than I've been doing this podcast, but this podcast has helped reinforce that with me. If there's a truck on the side of the road, get over and get over in plenty of time you never know who's going to step out from behind that thing like you said if they're trying to work on it they're right there on the fog line it's super dangerous so as a four-wheeler to other four-wheelers if there are any out there listening uh give them some damn room am i right exactly i mean you never know uh you know i look at like you said if there's a truck on the side of the road even if there's a passenger car on the side of the road I still, I always move over, even if it's a car that's disabled on the side of the road, because you're, you're exactly right. You don't know. Is there someone that's laying on the front, on the ground in front of the car? Is there someone that's going to be coming around the front corner of that car? And unfortunately, you wouldn't see them until it's too late. So give them as much room as possible uh, and be aware that if there's a vehicle there, there's very likely a person not too far not that too far away. Absolutely. Now, with respect to, uh, you mentioned the safety triangles and um, some other gear that might be on board the truck uh, for when a breakdown might happen. Do you have any advice as far as where that type of stuff is stored on the vehicle to make sure that it's accessible in a safe manner uh, when a breakdown might happen? Yep. Most, uh, most drivers do secure that stuff in their side box. You know, just I would tell a driver to make sure they're periodically observing those stuff, making sure they're still there, they're accessible, they're not they're not underneath uh, a bag of chains or underneath uh, whatever other materials they may have in the side box. And I would also advise before the driver gets out of the cab uh, to put on their safety vest uh, before they step out of the vehicle. Uh, obviously. Uh, On the side of the road, you need to be concerned about traffic. So, you know, observe the traffic in your mirrors. If if it looks real heavy, maybe it's better to get out the passenger side and uh, go from there as opposed to trying to open your uh, driver's side door and stepping out into traffic. Yeah, which just, I mean, even just the thought of it, just you saying open the driver's side door and step out into traffic makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up because you just, I don't trust people, Dean. I've, I've, uh, I'm only 38, but I've had enough experiences to know that 
there's a lot of people out there I just don't trust. You know, I, like you, you're a safety guy. I could trust you because I know that you're concerned about it. But it's really amazing to me how often people are just kind of flippant in their uh, respect to safety. So I'm glad to have you on here and talk a little bit about this because a lot of times people don't think about that unknown factor in a situation like this. You just can't ever guarantee that somebody's even watching the road. And we've all seen terrible videos of of things that can happen when people aren't paying attention. So um, this is all great info. Is there anything else that you would like to offer the drivers before I let you go? Well, I mean, again, you mentioned the videos and stuff that we see online. We always, we tend to see a lot of uh, accidents happen where there's an officer on the shoulder or a safety truck on the shoulder, you know, and a lot of times these accidents happen at night. So make sure as you approach those, those vehicles on the side of the road that you don't focus too heavily on the bright lights. Um, as they may temporarily blind you uh, or obscure your vision from what's actually going on around it. So, you know, be aware that those are there, but try not to look directly at the light. Look off into the dark a little bit so your eyes don't don't deceive you as you approach. There you go. That's some great advice from the safety manager, but that is a temporary title because we're getting him certified, and he soon will be the safety director at H&M, Dean Edmonds. Thank you so much, Dean. Really appreciate your time, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. You bet. Thank you. Yep. Take care. Quickly becoming one of my favorite segments on the show. It's when we have Deanna in from Driver Advocacy to talk to us about what the drivers are talking about and how things are going out on the road. Deanna, as always, thank you so much for giving us some of your time. How goes it today? It goes really well. I appreciate another you know, invite back to podcast. It's, it's becoming one of my favorite things to do. So I really enjoy it and I appreciate um, you guys always inviting me back. Yeah, it's a standing invite at this point. If I forget to invite you, just show up. That's you can, okay, you're yeah. welcome. The door's unlocked, you got it. and we keep the beers in the back. Um, so nice. it is. It is an episode about uh, handling roadside breakdowns uh, today, and I know that you've probably heard a lot about this. And really, can you talk to me about like the mindset of a driver uh, when they are broken down or when when they're stranded out on the side of the road because they don't have uh, the gear, the equipment functioning in the way that they need it to to finish their job? Um, I think it's a frustrating um, situation for drivers because there is a lack of control over um, breakdowns. Not only do they have to call someone to a specialty person to get them towed in to either Volvo or the H&M shop. Um, So they're kind of at the mercy of that. And sometimes that takes hours before they can even get someone to transport um, the truck. Um, And then it gets to the shop and depending on what's going on, sometimes they have to special order the parts. So that can take a couple of days. Um, So I can imagine the frustrating kind of builds on that because they're not able to get their miles for the week. It kind of throws their whole week off. So I can imagine it's just a frustrating experience all around. Yeah, from the word go. And I feel like the stress builds a little bit too in that there's so many variables that come into it where all of a sudden you're not just doing what you set out to do, which is putting miles behind you and getting there on time and being safe and all that. Now you have to worry about, well, do I need to pull over on a shoulder here and try to make a safe Uh, exit from the highway or whatever I'm on. Some of the roads that they're driving on don't have a shoulder that you could pull a a truck over on. Um, Then you've got the unpredictability of, like you said, the shops, the mechanics. Like, you know, there's good mechanics out there. There's a lot of good mechanics out there. There's also mechanics that will have your, you know, you turn your windshield wipers on and your bright lights come on. Like, there's things that can get messed up in the shop and go wrong on top of what's already wrong and and like you're saying it's just it's building frustration from the word go and i yeah. i can't imagine you know i mean i've been broken down the side of the road before in my four-wheeler but never uh, anything the size of a truck and i gotta 
be honest with you, like I, I want to stop and help people sometimes, but I don't have the authority or the wherewithal. I would just make the problem worse. I know that. You kind of seem like the type of person that could like help herself on the side of the road. Like you've had some experience. You could you could get yourself out of a jam, couldn't you? Yeah. Um, so I fun fact about me, I actually grew up with cars. Um, so I know pretty much a little more than your regular gal when it comes to mechanics. Um, like I can change a tire. I've changed oil multiple times. I've even changed like fuel pump, which is really difficult to brakes. I mean, I wow. can pretty much do anything. Um, I worked for Jiffy Lube for a while and changed oil for them and kind of some mechanics. So yeah, I, I know more than a normal gal, but that's due to my dad, you know, always kind of pushing me to kind of learn things to make sure I'm safely able to, you know, if I get broken down, kind of figure out what's going on under the hood yeah. so I can get where I'm going. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Well, on that, I seem to remember at some point in time you talking about like either you had a hot rod or your family has a hot rod. Like, tell us a little bit about yeah. the car because, you know, Joe Barganetti and I got on a, kind of a tangent last week talking about our cars and it snapped into my head. I think Deanna has something to say about this. So talk to me just a little bit about your pride yeah. and joy. Yeah. So um, I am, yeah, I have my dad's 69 uh super b oh. it is a <laughs> 440 uh horsepower um it's amazing and i'm looking to fully restore it i'm just waiting um because it's, it's got a new engine which is great but it needs a lot of interior work it needs a lot of exterior work um so i'm trying to put the love and touch into that he's had this car for decades and it's been kind of in a slow state of getting restored, mm -hmm. but I'm hoping to fully restore it now. That's so. so cool. Well, those cars are very, the Super Bs are very highly sought after. That's something that is a collector's item at this point. It's, it's You're telling me, I mean, I've had, you know, I've had multiple people tell me like I have, so I have two. So I have one that's fully, almost fully done. And then I have a parts car that's kind of just like in case something breaks on the main car, I can kind of pull it off there. Um, so people want to give me 30000 just for the parts car. Yeah. And I'm like, it <laughs> doesn't even have wheels. Yeah. Like, you're going to have to tow that thing out of here. Right. Like, And I'm like, okay, well, I mean, I've gotten really close, but I, I, I need some of the parts on it. So I can't, you know, theoretically sell it. But yeah, yeah. No, I'm a huge motorhead. Yeah. They're such cool cars, and and I actually, it's funny that we'll we'll figure out these things as we go on, and the podcast continues to grow. But I have an uncle that has four of them that lives out in Ohio, in like really rural Ohio farmland. I've I've never met the guy. He's he's on my mom's side of the family. They don't travel. We've never been out there to see them. But my mom spent a lot of time out there as a kid, and that's all they used to do in the summer is race their super bees up and down. They have a quarter mile strip out there, and they would just run them all day long that is so cool it's, it's that is awesome so cool. it's awesome and i think yeah. we're gonna get to talk a lot of cars on this show which i i do enjoy you know I, I can't i can't sit here and act like i don't have like this little sort of obsession with hot rods you know no it it definitely um especially going to you know races and quarter miles and all that, it, it's just a different feel it's just you automatically feel like you're walking in fast and furious and you're like i'm cool i can do this like <laughs> want to race me yeah no you don't because i'm gonna beat you <laughs> that's just you know that's the thoughts i try to keep in my head all the time every time i walk into a room i'm cool you think you could beat me you know just <laughs> You're like i've been diesel whatever yeah, right. i'm muscles uh so getting back on topic here um i i would assume driver advocacy is a very good thing to have while you are broken down on the side of the road and just waiting. I've heard stories about guys sitting there for six, seven hours before just watching the time tick by. Do you get a lot of calls from guys that are broken down, just kind of hanging out, looking to pass the time and chat with somebody? Oh, of course. So many. I can't even count how many. Um, yeah, I'll just have, you know, incoming calls and they're like, you know, my tire blew or, you know, any random kind of thing where I'm just going in for regular maintenance mm -hmm. and I'm sitting here, you know, they're doing the inspections, they're doing 
um, what have you, and it's going to be a couple hours. Do you have time to chat? And I'll be like, yeah, do it. So I'm all about that. Like, I, I think um, it is kind of boring when you're waiting for your, I mean, I, even if you're getting a, like, a, you know, just your tires rotated, it seems to take forever. And you're like, do I bring a book? Do I, br I mean, come on. Like, it's just, it's, ah. It, it's boring. Yeah, it's yeah. boring. I mean, if there's 18 <laughs> of those tires that they need to rotate, that's like a math equation just from the from the word go. So I imagine, yeah, bring a book, bring I two. Would, I wouldn't even know. I'd be like, wait, which one did I put over <laughs> yeah, here? Where, exactly. where does that one go? Like, what? <laughs> Yeah, I don't have a brain that's built for rotating that many tires. I get lost when I have four, and uh, that's a bad that's bad news. So, well, uh, real quick, it, it, you know, it, it's very good advice to your drivers out there. If you're sitting there for six hours, uh, Deanna's got time, and you should definitely give her a call. Take advantage of driver advocacy because we are one of those companies that has something like that for you to take advantage of. And a lot of those other drivers are just out there twiddling their thumbs because they don't have someone fantastic like Deanna to call up and chat with. Uh, we get the privilege once a week right here on this show, and we couldn't be happier about it. She can fix your, uh, change your tires and replace your fuel pump. It's Deanna from Driver Advocacy. Hit your hours one more time for them so they know when you're working. Yeah, so I've, I'm with Monday through Friday. I'm Eastern Time, 10 to 6 p.m., and then I work three hours on Sunday, 3 to 6 p.m. It's that easy. All you got to do is call her up. Thank you so much for coming by. We'll see you again next week, I hope. Absolutely. It's an absolute pleasure. All right. Thanks, Deanna. Great stuff from everybody today. I feel so lucky being the host of this podcast and get to welcome so many awesome people uh, that help me out and make this so that you don't just have to listen to me for an hour uh, because we all know how that goes. Thank you, James, Deanna, uh, Scott, Dean, and of course, David Rodriguez, our driver profile from today. Great stuff out there. Really appreciate it. Don't forget, next week, we're going to have the episode on the CVSA International Road Check. This is a big deal. It affects you. They will be looking for uh, anti-lock brakes, and I think load securement is kind of their focus here. So we'll bring you all the info that you need next week. Thanks for tuning in to the H&M Trucking Podcast. I'm your host, Marcus. And as always, stay fresh, cheese bags. Thank you for listening to the H&M Trucking Podcast. Please leave a review, subscribe, and connect with Marcus over at the H&M Trucking social media channels. And if you're considering a job at H&M, find us at hmtrucking.com. Until next time, stay safe and ahead of the curve drivers.